And it is uh, my great pleasure now to introduce our guest uh, lecturer, Thomas Doden, who is the senior lecturer at the Center for Inter Interdisciplinary and Special Studies at the College of the Holy Cross. In addition to Holy Cross, Thomas taught at the University of Massachusetts, Clark University, and Dartmouth College, among others. Dr. Doughton specializes in the history of people of color and their relationships with whites in central New England. He is the co-editor with Eugene McCarthy uh, of the book, From Bondage to Belonging, The Worcester Slave Narratives. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Doughton. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you for that nice introduction, Jim, and uh, also thank the Society for the opportunity to make certain that people of color become included in some of what we're considering. It's not my intention to um, reprise Ray Raphael's work, but I do want to make certain that African American people um, in 1774 are part of this master narrative. Um, the Jim had mentioned the closing of the courts, and I'll just begin with one of the more curious anecdotes in Worcester history. Um, Judge Timothy Payne, who did not live at the Oaks, but elsewhere on Lincoln Street, was one of the people appointed um, counselors by the Crown to exercise uh, political authority on behalf of the British. Um, they were summoned, and, and that's Mandamus, Call was summoned in Latin, so he was one of the Mandamus counselors, along with two other interesting people from this region. One is um, General Timothy Bruggles, whose daughter Bathsheba Spooner is known to some people here, and the other would have been James Murray from Butler. Now, Judge Payne, who was married to one of the Chandler sisters, seems to have been a somewhat solid, staid, respectable 18th century gentleman. And he was escorted from his house by this crowd that Jim had mentioned to the common here in Worcester. Um, and he was being compelled to resign the royal appointment. Judge Payne, who was not used to responding to the rabble, um, had difficulty with the suggestion that he should take off his hat and recognize the sovereignty of the people. So, in a jostle, his white wig, his powdered wig, fell to the ground. And it was put, picked up by Worcester Winslow, his slave, whom we were told was as black as the ace of spades, who, for a considerable time, sported that powdered wig and considered it um, one of his treasures. So, I mean, that's sort of easing in. I, I do want to begin with something um, a little different, which is also from the Society's collections. This is a document that reads, Know all men by these presents that whereas I, George, commonly called George Lynn, was once the slave of Joseph Lind Esquire, and by him was brought up from my childhood, and whereas I have for a number of years past lived in his house unconstrained and using much liberty during my time abroad, considering myself as free, and whereas he has fed and clothed me and provided me in my sicknesses all this time that I have been in his house. Now that I have married, am in about to leave him in consideration of the good services heretofore done and kindnesses provided to me by the said Joseph and his family. I release Joseph Lynn, his heirs and assignees of all demands whatsoever until the day of my departure. This was witnessed by Edward Bangs here in Worcester, and in many ways um, is one of the means by which we can understand why people of color supported the struggle in 1774. 
why they participated in what was a discourse of freedom. Their voices were very strident and very clear. And also why such a large number of people from Worcester, Worcester County, enlisted um, in the Continental Army. So basically, um, I would want to begin by talking a little bit about slavery in this region. And, you know, I'll start by talking about politician, merchant, man of affairs, Judge Thomas Steele of Leicester, was one of the earlier slave owners of Worcester County, and in many ways, he's representative of regional residents who owned Africans. Steele was a Boston native, son of a Captain Thomas Steele, who was a Scots immigrant, businessman, and slave merchant. The elder Steele, who had graduated from the University of Glasgow, was a wealthy businessman and one of the incorporators of the Scots Charitable Association. He served as a Suffolk County Justice of Peace and Deputy Judge of the Court of Vice Admiralty, and he was considered by his contemporaries, quote, the most noted arbitrator or referee in his time in all lawsuits and differences, unquote. Additionally, Captain Steele married well his first wife, Jane, a daughter of Governor Samuel Allen of New Hampshire. And with his family, Captain Steele lived comfortably occupying a significant mansion on Hanover Street in the North End. The wealth of the elder Steele was to a great extent derived from his numerous business adventures. And as early as 1717, for example, he was sending vessels to the West Indies. Throughout the 1720s, Steele advertised regularly in Boston newspapers offering slaves for sale. He also sold the time of white servants, and in 1723 he entered into a partnership with a George Bethune, Steele and Bethune selling Bostonians a variety of imported goods, and they were in fact one of the largest slave importers of the 1720s. He was a one-time parishioner of Mather's Old North Church, um, and we know that Captain Steele transferred his membership to the more liberal Rattle Square Church, where he established a close personal relationship with Reverend Benjamin Cole, the pastor there. Now, when Jane Steele, his wife, died, Benjamin Coleman preached a sermon entitled The Death of God's Saints, Precious in His Sight, whose publication was underwritten by Steele. Captain John Steele, described by the Boston Newsletter as an eminent merchant, died age 71 in 1735. Benjamin Coleman again delivering his funeral sermon, one entitled The Peaceful End of a Perfect and Upright Life, which is a wonderful text if you have time to read this. After graduation from Harvard in the class of 1730, the younger Steele, quote, left Boston for a wild 500-acre farm in Leicester, unquote, which was worked by numerous slaves. The property of Leicester, occupied by Thomas Steele, had been purchased by his father from Judge Ian Menzies, another judge of Vice Admiralty Court, another slave owner, and the property became the home and inheritance of younger Steele. Similarly, slaves provided the younger, provided the younger steel may have come from his father. In 1733, for example, Tom Negro of Leicester, quote, a servant of Captain Thomas Steele, a Boston gentleman, unquote, was brought before the Worcester Justices of the Peace. The manuscript records tell us he was brought to court for failing to return to its owner a pocketbook or case he had found on the streets in Worcester. In 1736, the younger Steele married Mary, daughter of Benjamin and Elizabeth Pemberton, and Steele worked as a merchant building his home and a large store at the base of Meeting House Hill in Leicester, creating a comfortable home in the frontier served by black slaves." Unquote. At Leicester's first town meeting, Steele was named a selectman and town clerk beginning to exert influence on Leicester affairs. He was the town's representative at the general court for many years. 
and he was named to the Worcester County Court of Common Pleas, serving on the bench for over 19 years. Allegedly the only loyalist in Leicester, Judge Steele died early in 1776 and escaped exile. Now exemplary, he is like many of the other 18th century slave owners at the interior of Massachusetts. Um, the slave owners of his generation in the county were often connected to mercantile elites in coastal towns. Many of them moved to what was the frontier with the creation of Worcester County in 1732. Much as the famous Chandlers of Worcester came from New Roxbury, the current Woodstock, Connecticut, and immediately began occupying political appointments. Others located further west in this wilderness, um, in Athol, in Brookfield, um, some people moved to Dudley, Lancaster, and other towns. But most Massachusetts families in the 18th century did not own slaves, and this has a lot to do with explaining part of the participation of Africans in a discourse of liberty. Of 43,483 families in Massachusetts in 1765, I'm not going to do a lot of those precise numbers, but there's one for you. 43,483 families in Massachusetts in 1765, and of that number, one eighth of them owned 5,235 adult African slaves who were enumerated in a provincial census. The enumeration had to do with taxing. In central Massachusetts, accordingly, slaves were owned by a minority of residents. Hundreds of Africans nonetheless lived and died in bondage in this region, but their owners included, as I've said, individuals connected to politically conservative Anglo-American elite, clergymen, founders of town, men of affairs, people involved in county and state government, wealthy merchants, landowners with exclusive agricultural holdings, entrepreneurs like tavern or innkeepers, and some middle class town residents who needed domestic servants or household help. Additionally, there are artisans who worked in this area, although enslaved, practicing certain trade, and there were other individuals who invested in, quote, darkies, unquote, or who leased or rented out their slaves to other residents. Now, slaveholding in most rural areas of New England, like Worcester County, did reflect economic and social status. African servants were considered visible confirmation of rank, privilege, and distinction. But the average slave owner possessed one or two slaves, or at most, a small family of domestic servants, or one or two men who worked as hands, supplementing an owner's own labor on small farms. There are a few examples that are counter to this, and they're very unusual. One comes from Hopkinton in the East. Another also concerns Leicester, in particular people fleeing the British at Newport and bringing their slaves with them. Um, one of these individuals was Aaron Lopez, who brought several slaves with him, who is a prominent Jewish merchant prince, as it were, who had been born in Lisbon, Portugal. He and his family occupied a large, elegant mansion in Leicester. Actually, their property um, served as the foundation for Leicester Junior College. So he's an exception, and another exception is Squire Edwin Quincy, I mean, the squire should be tip off. Um, although primarily associated with Braintree in Boston, Quincy retired to Lancaster during the British blockade of Boston, bringing with him a retinue of slaves, one of whom died in Lancaster. And you know, he was distinguished, but he's unusual. So slave ownership here was um, on a different sort of scale, and this does have something to do with, as I said, the participation of people of color in this discourse of freedom. Again, just to put this into perspective for you, 
1754, a provincial census recorded 88 adult slaves over 16 years of age in Worcester County. In 1765, that number had increased to 317 slaves among the 34,000 people who lived in Worcester County at that time. And if we try to figure out where they were, uh, 27 people were at Lancaster, 39 were at Dracut, 16 were at Dunstable, 15 were at Groton, 12 were at Harvard, 17 were at Littleton, and another 35 people of color were at Lunenburg, Stowe, Pepperell, Shirley, or Townsend. Um, in fact, there were so many slaves at this time in the district, which would later become Barry, the Rutland district, that part of that township was called New Guinea by county residents at this period. But in Worcester, there were only 25 people of color enslaved. And actually, on the cusp of the revolution, 21 Worcester County towns claimed that there were no Negroes resident in their town, and 15 communities were home to one to five people of color. So the largest concentration of people of color in the interior of 18th century Massachusetts would be in towns along the border of Worcester and Middlesex counties, which is not surprising. And additionally, if we go really closer to the 1774, in 1771, 65 individuals in this area owned 79 adult slaves. 55 people each owned one slave. That represented 84.6% of slave ownership in these towns. Nine individuals owned two slaves. One person owned three slaves. And a single resident of Worcester County at that time is recorded owning four adult slaves. Now, there are some difficulties with the Massachusetts uh, census enumerations at this period of time. The tax was paid only on adult slaves um, between 16 and 65, so superannuated or elderly slaves or young slaves were not tallied. So this is a rough sense of how many people were living here at that period of time. And the numbers are significant. The numbers are significant um, because many of the Africans who participate in the struggle before the start of the conflict and who will later see service um, in the Continental Army lived in white households, um, lived very closely with their white owners. There is an extreme degree of literacy among slaves at Worcester County at this time. Um, we know this from several different sources. Uh, in part, um, literacy was required for salvation. And we can take Cotton Mather as an example, who argued quite eloquently in Boston at the start of the century that Africans had been placed into the hands of Europeans to be led to salvation. And there could be no salvation without a direct personal relationship to the printed word. So Massachusetts slaves, unlike Africans, even in Rhode Island and Connecticut, were overwhelmingly literate. Makes a difference. It also makes a difference um, in terms of how these individuals saw the world. We know from different sort of narratives and anecdotal sources that Africans who lived in white households discussed politics. Uh, there is a narrative by a woman who is executed for infanticide, but she does speak of staying, Patience Boston actually, she does speak of staying up late with her enslaved husband, talking about political affairs and going through the newspapers that had been handed down by their owners. And this shows up in other, other kinds of documentation. Consistently, also, as people are running away 
in the 1750s, in 1760s, in increasing numbers, many of them are defined as being able to both read and write, and they are considered crafty Negroes because they have forged documents and passes and other pieces of paper. So this literacy um, is very important to any discussion of African participation in the discourse of freedom at this time. Also something to be considered is that, again, you know, without going through the cumbersome documentation for you, a majority of enslaved people in Worcester County in the 1770s are American born. They are not African. Their parents may be African, but they are born in the colony. They have grown up living among whites. They have grown up speaking English and to a great degree are assimilated and seemingly sophisticated people. So if I talk of the petitions that um, we mentioned in the flyer for this event, well, that's part of a um, certain sort of background that would have been familiar to most adult African Americans in Worcester County. For example, in 1765, Jenny Slew in Ipswich had successfully sued her owner for illegally depriving her of her liberty. It's a very important case, although it was limited to Salem in the Interior Court of Common Pleas on a writ, it was something that many people were aware of in the state or in, in the colony at that period of time. She had allegedly been taken with force and arms and held in servitude as a serve, as a slave, and did sue for her freedom, which had been granted to her by the court, along with compensation. Not long after that, other slaves began filing freedom suits, as they're called, some successful, some not. But interestingly, this is the same decade, the 1760s, when African people began producing narratives. We have an extraordinary work um, from uh, one author who had gone to sea and been kidnapped, and we have several very significant confessional narratives, including one um, with a notorious author from Worcester, but in any of them. Uh, this, we see an emergence of African authorship in the 1760s, which again leads into part of how people are part of a much wider discourse of freedom and liberation. In 1773, the year before the events we're considering here in Worcester, Caesar, who had been owned by Richard Greenleaf in Newburyport, sued for his freedom, which was granted. And in 1774, we have four examples of other Africans suing for freedom, which they'd gotten. Now, there are um, anti-slavery works that appear some as early as the 1730s, but by the 1770s, many people, including people in Worcester County, are not pleased with the continuation of slavery. Just as an example, as, as early as 1755, Salem authorized sending a petition to the general court asking for an end to slavery. In 1766, Boston instructed its representatives to work for, quote, a total abolishing of slavery among us, and that you move for a law to prohibit the importation and purchasing of slaves in the future. And we know that doesn't happen, probably for economic reasons. But in 1767, the town of Worcester instructed Joshua Bigelow, its representative at the General Court, quote, that you use your influence to obtain a law to put an end to the unchristian and impolitic practice of making slaves of human species in this province, and that you give your vote for none to serve in His Majesty's Council, who you may have reason to think 
against such a law. Um, within the same year, interestingly, a very critical tract entitled Considerations on Slavery in a Letter to a Friend appeared by Nathaniel Appleton, a Boston merchant and member, later member of the city's first committee of correspondence. Additionally, in 1767, there also occurred the first movement to actually pass an act abolishing slavery and slave trade, which although unsuccessful, according to several 19th century historians, was the nearest approach in all the colonial and provincial legislation of Massachusetts. So, in the late 1760s, we also see an earnest address to my country on slavery by Reverend Samuel Webster of Salisbury. And the 1770s, early 1770s, will witness a proliferation of printed materials, some widely distributed throughout all of the provinces, all the colonies, but several um, well-read in Massachusetts. Now, the first act here in the 1770s that you know is a concern to this particular topic is that in 1771, the Massachusetts legislature sent to Governor Thomas Hutchinson an act to forbid the importation of African slaves, which he vetoed. In 1773, Thomas Denny, the Leicester representative to the General Court, received his instruction from Leicester, quote, and we have the highest regard for, so as even to revere the name of liberty, we cannot behold, but with the greatest abhorrence, any of our fellow creatures in a state of slavery. Therefore, we strictly enjoin you to use your utmost influence that a stop may be put to the slave trade by the inhabitants of this province, by imposing a heavy duty on imported Negroes, or by making a law that every Negro brought or imported should be a free man or woman as soon as they come within the jurisdiction of this province, and that every Negro child henceforth born here in this said government should be free at the same age that the children of white people are. These become um, somewhat significant because if we go to 1774, our year in question, another bill to forbid importation of slaves is sent to Governor Hutchinson after having passed both houses of the provincial legislature, which he again refuses to sign, claiming he had no authority from the Crown to sign any such bill. And in the same year, Deacon Benjamin Coleman of Newbury published in the Essex Journal the first of his numerous writings advocating an end to the slave trade and manumission of Massachusetts slaves. And in the words of historian Joshua Coffin, Quote, he wrote and talked and prayed on the subject, was instant in season and out of season. No one entered more deeply into the cause of the suffering and the dumb and displayed more zeal and ability than Colvin. Now, 1774 is, is you know, the year we're looking at. And the reason I, I've cited these documents is that when we look at what Africans are submitting to the legislature, this, the documents sound very familiar, and they should sound familiar because Africans in Worcester County and in other parts of the state have discussed these documents, know them, and intentionally invoke, the sim invoke similar language. For example, in 1773, um, folks address a somewhat famous petition to Thomas Hutchinson, the governor, and it is described as the humble petition of many slaves living in Boston and other towns in this province in this namely that your excellency and honors and the honorable representatives would be pleased to take their unhappy state and condition under your wise and just consideration. But what's significant is this kind of language. We desire to please God who loves mankind, who sent his son to die for their salvation, and who is no respecter of persons, that he hath lately put into some of the hearts 
of multitudes on both sides of the water to bear our burdens, some of whom are men of great note and influence, who have pleaded our cause with arguments which we hope will have their weight with this honorable court. We presume not to dictate to your excellency and honors, being willing to rest our cause on your humanity and justice, yet would beg leave to say a word or two on the subject. Although some Negroes are vicious, who doubtless may be punished and restrained by the same laws which are in force against other of the king's subjects, there are many others of quite different character, and who, if made free, would soon be able as well as willing to bear part in the public charge. Many of them are of good, part, good natural parts, are discreet, sober, honest, and industrious, and may it be not said of many that they are virtuous and religious, although their condition is in itself so unfriendly to religion and every moral virtue except patience. This document goes on to say, um, we have no property, we have no wives, no children, we have no city, no country, but we have a Father in heaven, and we are determined as far as his grace shall enable us, and as far as our degraded, contemptuous life will admit to keep all his commandments. Especially we will be obedient to our masters so long as God in his sovereign province shall suffer us to be holden in bondage. So I mean, and the tone there uh, is obviously influenced by much of the religious and political writing against the crown and against slavery. And again, it um, shows that people are aware of these things. Another document, same year, would tell us, we expect great things from men who have made such a noble stand against the designs of their fellow men to enslave them. We cannot but wish and hope, sir, that you will have the same grand object. We mean civil and religious liberty in view in your next sessions. The divine spirit of freedom seems to fire every human breast on this continent, except such as our brood to assist in executing the execrable plan. So, this is a very curious document because it says we are willing to submit to such regulations and laws as may be made relative to us until we leave the province, which we determine to do as soon as we can from our joint labors procure money to transport ourselves to some part of the coast of Africa, which we propose a settlement, and they actually go on to say, and we are very desirous of asking your assistance to help us return to Africa. So, uh, though these petitions um, often, you know, um, are not grammatical, the spelling is, is certainly chaotic and confusing, um, they are very important nonetheless because they reflect, as I say, a participation of people of color in this discourse of freedom. And I know this is the third or fourth time I've said that, but that's something I want to make certain that you all leave um, understanding. Uh, that so much history would have us imagine that things happen to African Americans and people of color. But they are, in fact, passive agents upon which other people um, operate. But in this period, Africans are active, and they are active in demanding their freedom. So we have several very curious things that take place in the 1770s. First, people ask to be set free. Okay. They're not getting a, a response to that. And several people um, have written about machinations at the, in Boston. For example, uh, Patricia Bradley does a wonderful job of explaining what James Otis is doing, and some backhanded deals of Sam Adams and other people um, in the legislature to prevent these issues from coming to a full, full vote. But even though um, 
these things are, are happening. They're happening in a context where, you know, black folks are part of this much larger struggle. So, three very important petitions. One, that you set us free, and this does not come to, to fruition. Two, if you won't set us free, that you help us acquire vessels so that we can return to Africa. Three, if you won't do that, that you give us some land in the western part of the state, ideally one of the counties in the Berkshires, so we can set up our own nation and our own country. Now, those three things together, in a relatively short period of time, a 14, 15 month period of time, in the 1770s, points to, at least as I would understand it, you know, a sophistication on the part of these enslaved people. So it is not surprising that in the uh, first issue of the Massachusetts Spy, which I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, there is a notice from William Henshaw, the clerk, um, that says, whereas the Negroes in the counties of Bristol and Worcester on the 24th March last petitioned the Committee of Correspondence for the County of Worcester, then convened in Worcester, to assist them in obtaining their freedom, um, which is a year later. Well, you know, Isaiah Thomas publishes this in the, the first Massachusetts spy out here. And in the summer when folks are submitting these petitions to the legislature. Abigail Adams wrote to John, quote, there has been in town a conspiracy of the Negroes. At present, it is kept pretty private and was discovered by one who endeavored to dissuade them from it. They conducted in this way to draw up a petition to the governor, telling him they would fight for him, provided he would arm them and engage to liberate them if he conquered. Now, she says, and I'm not sure why she calls this a conspiracy, but she says, I wish most sincerely there was not a slave in the province it always appeared the most iniquitous scheme to me to fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. Um, it should not be surprising that African American people, whether enslaved or free, had come to the same conclusion that there was indeed an inconsistency to be considered here. And a measure of the extent to which people of color were willing to believe promises um, can be demonstrated in the widespread enlistment, whether we look at African Americans and Native Americans from Worcester County or other parts of this province or, or state at that time, um, enlisting. The numbers are overwhelming um, in some communities uh, where you might have had 15 eligible African American males, 12 or 13 enlist. Uh, I think many of these men are very serious in their commitment to what they perceive to be freedom. They knew what they were fighting for, at least they thought they knew what they were fighting for. And in the national period, many of the African American families that become established in Worcester County are only able to become established because of Revolutionary War pensions, um, which enable dozens of African American men to acquire small homesteads whether it's um, Jeffrey Hemingway in Worcester, for example, um, who Holly Eyes I've written about, 
or other men scattered throughout the county. So, if I had to come to some sort of conclusion, my conclusion would be that throughout 1774 and the 1770s, African people were very much involved in the discourse of freedom. They were sources or voices from which more of the revolutionary rhetoric was repeated. And many of these men took this very seriously. Within a decade, they will enlist. Now, I'm not sure this is true for all the people of color. I mean, if indeed one out of five revolutionary soldiers was either a Native American or an African American, <coughs> Um, then people of color are very important in the struggle and in some parts of the country um, tilt the balance. But in Massachusetts, the enlistments do reflect a commitment to freedom on the part of these people as they understood it.